Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, we have Heron De Silva of Allspring Global Investments back with us for the second time on the podcast. And this time we dive into his personal side of his investments, exploring how he manages his own portfolio and what insights we can gain from looking at his approach. We discuss how he thinks about incorporating bonds and equities in his portfolio, the future of the 60-40, long short equity strategies and more. Plus we get into topics like international exposure, rebalancing, alternative investments, inflation, and the other things that Heron thinks about when managing his personal portfolio. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this Show Us Your Portfolio episode with Heron De Silva. This episode is brought to you by Alpha Architect for Advisors. Whether you're an established firm or just starting out, you know the right systems can be the difference maker to achieving your growth goals. That's why Alpha Architect now offers a suite of turnkey model portfolios that can be customized to fit your practice. Built on Alpha Architect's decades of rigorous academic research, our model portfolios aim to systematize portfolio management so that you can spend less time tinkering with funds and more time finding your next great client. Systemize today to save time tomorrow. That's building with conviction. That's Alpha Architect for advisors. To learn more about Alpha Architect's model portfolios and to schedule a consultation, visit advisors.alphaarchitect.com slash models. That's advisors, A-D-V-I-S-O-R-S dot alphaarchitect.com slash models. Alpha Architect for advisors, built with conviction. Hi, Harin. Thanks for coming back and joining us again. Hi, Justin. Hi, Jack. Great to be back. When we had you on last time, we talked uh, factor investing and how you go about building the actual strategies that you manage and the funds that you run. But in today's discussion, we're going to do a little something different. We're going to talk about the personal side of your investment portfolio. And um, this is something we've done um, with a handful of past guests and professional investors. And I think that people that listen to us always kind of learn something new when they hear people like you talk about how they manage um, their personal assets. Given that you're in the investment business, you might approach it a little bit differently than you know your typical investor would. Um, and so these discussions, you know, are always fun for us and I think unique for our audience as, as they learn sort of different perspectives, um, from different people. So I wanted to start and we'll get into the details here as we kind of pull back the onion, but we always like to start at sort of the highest level with our guests, which is when you're thinking about your investment portfolio, what are the biggest long-term goals that you're trying to achieve with your investments? So for me, those have changed because obviously when I was younger, it was making sure that my kids were going to be okay. I mean, I have two kids. I think the best investment you can make for kids is education. So they both spent a lot of time in college, gotten graduate degrees. You know, the biggest risk that my kids face, and I think the next generation faces, is longevity risk. And the fact that your career will probably have to be rebooted sometime in your life. Uh, I was, I'm fortunate. I've been in the investment business my whole life. I didn't have to do that. But I think our kids with longevity are going to have to do that. And the biggest way to hedge that is with a good education. So I feel like I've taken care of that. So leaving money to my heirs is not something I worry about. So I kind of have two buckets I worry about uh, for me personally. One is having enough um, funds to live, you know, pay the medical, property taxes, everything like that. And then the second bucket, which is things like toys and uh, wine and vacations. So I, I, I'm continually optimizing with respect to two different buckets. One of them is a really must-have bucket, which is a liability for me to live as, you know, as long as I need or as long as I'm going to. And then the second part is the optional bucket. So I, for me, that separation is really important. And it used to be three buckets. The third bucket was my kids, but I've sort of taken care of that, fortunately. You know, uh, just as a side note, this rebooting of, you know, the careers for younger people, I think it's a very interesting, that's a whole nother topic. But I mean, I think with like, you know, what's going on with AI and stuff like that, it seems to me that 
that is probably going to be truer for younger professionals. Um, yeah, which is interesting to think about. Absolutely, and you know, I mean, prior generation, if you were a steel worker, you had to do that, right? Um, and sometimes your skill level, you weren't sufficiently educated to go somewhere else, and that was made it very difficult for that kind of person. But I think that's going to happen even in the white-collar workforce going forward. Yeah, Justin, at the pace this is going, you and I might need to reboot our careers like next week. <laughs> um, <laughs> considering AutoGPT is now programming ChatGPT on its own. I mean, we're, this is moving so fast. Um, let's talk about retirement just for a second, because some people view retirement as... Um, you know, headed out uh, to the golf course or, you know, relaxing on a beach and reading a book. Um, I mean, I know you're a pretty active guy uh, with things that you do outside of work, but, you know, when you think about your retirement, how do you think about it? Where do you fall in the spectrum of like just going into retirement easy or do you sort of see yourself doing something else in retirement? Uh, I actually don't see retiring. Um because I, I really enjoy what I do. So I, I, I'm not one of those people who says, you know, I'm, you know when I'm this age, I want to quit and go sailing or play golf and do nothing else. I, I really enjoy what I do, but I'm really aware of the fact that, you know, your marginal product is definitely decreasing as you get older, right? What you can do, the contribution you can make. So at some point, you can't add value anymore, Um and sometimes it's for medical reasons. Um, you know, one of my closest partners uh, had early onset Alzheimer's. And, you know, he didn't retire because he wanted to. He didn't retire because he couldn't make a contribution anymore. So I think, as I think about myself, that's how I kind of think about it. I, it's something that I would like to work for a long time. But at the same time, I want everybody around me to feel like I'm bringing something to the table. Uh, and, you know, just like Michael Jordan, you want to quit when you're ahead, right? Quit when, before somebody asks you to leave. And so that's my, my goal. So, you know, from a financial planning perspective, you know, I think about the quote from Maya Angelou, which is, you know, hope for the best, hope, we, hope you can work forever, be, but prepare for the worst, right? You may have something come up that, you know, I'm in my mid 60s that says, you know, I can't work anymore. And uh, so I'm prepared for that. And, you know, don't be unsurprised by anything in between. So I love that quote as a way of planning for the rest of my life. You kept our streak going here because we have yet to have a guest who's going to retire, um, who, who feels like they're going to, at least the, the traditional form of retirement right. where they're not doing anything. I mean, part of it is we probably self-select a certain type of person for the podcast who is probably going to, you know, want, want to work and have that, you know, as part of their life. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like we, we've never gotten an answer. You know, I plan to go play golf or, you know, sail or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. We're also fortunate, right? By in a profession where, where you can actually work until your, you know, later years, because it's not physical work. Um, yeah, no, def definitely. It's, it's yeah, when you're working with your mind and as long as these AI bots don't take over or something, we can, uh, yeah, we, we can still work. Um, yeah, I want to shift quick and talk about your um, your asset allocation. So we like to start these just at a high level, thinking about like, we'll dig into each one in detail, but thinking about like what the asset classes you have in your portfolio are. I mean, are you pretty much a stock and bonds type guy? Do you do a lot of different things? Can you just kind of give us an overview of how you think about that? Yeah, so I don't own any individual securities. Uh, I think it's a, it's a compliance nightmare um, and it distracts me from managing my clients' money and doing what I think I do best, which is managing portfolios. So I actually don't own any individual securities. Uh, excluding my residents, I do have a fair amount in non-liquid securities, so non-marketable securities, so about 35%, which is a pretty big number. Um, so this is, uh, you know, one's in a, a startup, um, one's in a blueberry farm, Ming project that a friend of mine uh, got going. One's in a aerospace, a small aerospace startup. Um, so these are all companies that were started by friends of mine or people I know, and they approach me. I really like the idea. I like that the edge, the edge they had, the business model they had, and so I, it's been a significant portion of my allocation. Now it's something that's declining over time, because. As the investments mature and the companies fail or they get taken out, hopefully more of the latter than the former, uh, 
you know, you get a liquid payout and then are able to move that into your liquid portfolio. So my goal is to actually have that amount shrink over time. So it's about 35% right now in kind of illiquid, you know, crazy startup type ventures that it's either friends of mine or people I've known through the business that have started. And how do you think about the liquid portion? Um, so do you, do you have just your traditional stocks and bonds or what are you doing in there? Yeah, so there's uh, there's no treasuries and there's no bonds in in the tri- I mean the, in the, in the terms of AAA bonds um, and there's no no stocks. Uh, but I do have um, a lot of mutual funds and ETFs. So of the sixty five percent. That's in marketable securities. That has about 150 percent leverage. So it's long and short. It's got a lot of exposure to our funds, the funds that I manage. So it's got a beta of about 0.3, and a market exposure of 70 percent. So I know there's a lot there in the different components, but if you think about my portfolio, it's about 70 percent net long, but it has a beta of about 0.3 and 150% leverage. And the three major asset classes in there are equities in the form of mutual funds and ETFs, EM debt, and it's mostly unhedged EM debt, so it's denominated in the foreign currency, and low credit bonds. Interesting. I want to I want to dig into a few of those different things, but but first I want to take a step back and just ask you about the 60-40 portfolio, because obviously you're like a lot of our guests and your portfolio looks very different than the 60-40 portfolio. And I'm just wondering, you know, we'll have a lot of people who watch the show who are invested in something similar to the 60-40 portfolio. How do you think about that going forward? I mean, a lot of people are saying, you know, in a world of inflation, in a world of maybe valuations above average, you know, the 60-40 portfolio, we're not going to get in the next 30 years what we got in the last 30 years. How do you think about the 60-40 portfolio in general? You mean the potential performance of the 60-40 portfolio? Yeah. I think it's going to be substantially less than you, obviously, than you've experienced in the last uh, 100 years. Uh, for the reasons you've just hit on, which is inflation, uh, very low interest rates. I mean, you don't have the wind in your back anymore as a as a as a bond investor. So I would be surprised if you see you know anything. I mean, you're not going to get anywhere close to double digits with that kind of investment strategy. So I would urge people to think us about something different. Um, and I think I don't think about the 60/40 portfolio at all actually when I think about investing. Yeah, that, that's interesting. You know, that, that's been a common thing on the podcast is, you know, I think there's this default for many of us to say, all right, let's start with a 60-40 portfolio and then figure out what I want to change. But I, I think a lot of people like you were saying, you know, no, let's like start from first principles. Let's figure out how I want to build a portfolio and let's not assume I have to start with a 60-40 portfolio. So I, I think that's an interesting lesson a lot of us can take from this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like, I think there's one essence of the 60 portfolio that kind of makes sense, which is don't rely on one thing to drive your returns. So if you had only two assets, that would make sense, right? But I would argue for the 40-60, not the 60-40, because you should have less in the riskier asset and then leverage it up. So I would take a 40-60 portfolio leveraged up over a 60-40 portfolio, but that's a whole nother story. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about your thought process with bonds? I think you mentioned you have emerging market debt and you have, I think, higher yielding bonds, you don't have any treasuries or, or corporates, you know, high grade corporates or anything like that. Is that something about the current situation that says you want to be in those? Or is that something about, you know, just in general, you prefer those types of things? Can you just talk about your thought process and getting to like your bond allocation? Sure. Yeah. So when I thought about uh, my investment for portfolio first, um, I want some diversification. So I look for three return sources. So I basically have a third, a third, a third. So a third of my portfolio return I expect to come from Alpha, and those are obviously the funds I manage. Who knows if that's ever going to show up, but obviously I believe in it, and it's done that in the past. A third comes from what I call the global equity risk premium, and this is the premium you get from investing in global equities, whether it's U.S. and otherwise, and I know we can debate this issue of whether you should be in global markets or not. I happen to be a to have to see the benefits of global investing. So I have that component. And then the last third is other risk premier. And for me, the problem with the traditional bond portfolio is you're not really harvesting a very big risk premium for the amount of capital you're deploying. So I'd really like the return premium you get from emerging market debt. Uh, 
Most of that comes from the fact that you have unhedged currency exposure. So you need to be hedged. So if you buy things like Brady bonds, you're not going to get as much as a bank, right? Um, the same with high yield debt. I mean, high yield debt was an innovation that happened in, in my lifetime, right? I mean, I remember when Mike Milken and everybody started selling these bonds and the spreads were really large, and they're still pretty large in some segments. So I really that like that as a premium, but I'm always looking for premium that I can add to my portfolio in that last one third that's going to help me achieve my return goal. So when I think about my, the return goal for my portfolio, a third of it is going to come from the equity risk premium, a third from other risk premiums, and the last third is from alpha. So if the alpha doesn't deliver, that's okay because I got several other things driving helping drive the portfolio forward. Yeah, it kind of made me think about the Ray Dalio idea of like having all these unique sources of, you know, he, I think he talks about unique sources of alpha, but the idea of having these unique sources of return in your portfolio, you know, rather than, you know, I think a lot of people tend to have sources of return that they don't realize maybe are very correlated with each other. And even with stocks and bonds, people are learning that a little bit right now, that those sources of return are not always uncorrelated. Sometimes they're correlated. So I think that that's a, an interesting thing you're doing is trying to find these alternative things. It gives you a, a better diversified mix. Right. A absolutely. And I think it's really, really hard to do this if you're a U.S.-based investor. Because when you look backwards in time in the U.S., I mean, the last 40 years, U.S. stocks have dominated everything else, right? So you tend to look at that and kind of go, oh, wow, I should just do this one thing and I'll be okay. But there's no reason that that's going to repeat. And furthermore, you know, when you're in one asset, you don't sleep well at night because you don't have all these different drivers for you, right? You only have, it's, it's one thing that drives your ultimate terminal wealth. And I think that is really important. The diversification aspect is really important. How about your equity, your, your sort of your beta portion of your portfolio, your more long only equity? Is it, I, I know you have a long side of your funds and we're gonna talk about your funds in a second, but is there anything else in there in terms of you know the long only equity exposure you have? Uh, so there's no, there's very few high beta funds. Um, you know, it's everything I do has a very strong value quality bias. So value quality low beta. If you looked at my portfolio, you'd say, oh wow, this is very long value, low quality, and it's leveraged because, like I said, the the non traditional, I mean, the liquid component has 150% leverage. So I'm a big believer in building a low risk equity portfolio with the right premium in there and then leveraging it up to get the return you want. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's, that's something a lot of people have talked to. We've got a few other people on the podcast who do take a very similar approach. Damn, I thought it's my think, idea. I didn't know, you know, to, personally, I didn't know a lot about it until like the last couple of years. You know, I, I've learned a lot about that type of approach. Um, you know, so that, that's been a, a great learning experience for me. Do you think at all about, I mean, I think you mentioned you have something like a 0.2 beta overall right now. Point do, you, three. do you think at all about think, point three. Point three, okay. Do you think anything at all about valuations? So like, does the equity exposure you have, is it a function of your thoughts on the market at any given time, you know, that you think things are overvalued or is that something that's pretty consistent over time and you're not really making two major changes to that? So I do rebalance um, pretty frequently. Uh, I think the rebalancing premium is not exploited as much as people should be exploiting it. Uh, and I do use valuation measures as a guide because if you're in the investment industry, if you're rebalancing portfolios, you have to, uh, you know, fill out a bunch of disclosure forms and so on. So it's really important not to rebalance frequently because there's a lot of paperwork involved. So I'm a big believer in using long run valuation measures like the CAPE measure. Um, you know, that's a, to me a very important uh, component. So I do use that to vary the, not so much to vary the portfolio beta, but as a rebalance trigger. So I have a target as allocation. I let the portfolio drift from that. And I use the valuation measures and the overall exposures as a trigger to rebalance back. So, and the reason it's important is occasionally you get substantial opportunities, like what happened, um, you know, a few weeks ago with SVB, I mean, you had kind of a lot of unnecessary panic in the market, and that was a great opportunity if you were overweight equities to kind of say, oh, yeah, I can now rebalance, sorry, underweight equities, you could rebalance back in. 
I want to ask, going back to this idea of alternative sources of return, I, I want to talk a little bit about your funds and, and the approach you, you use, because, you know, so many of us run factor portfolios, but 99% of us don't run it the way it's run in the academic research. You know, 99% of us just run it as long only portfolios. And you're running a, a long, short factor strategies or, or multiple long, short factor strategies. So I'm wondering if you could just talk about, like, in theory, the advantages of running that type of approach. So the the idea of long and short isn't isn't new because as you point out it's in the academic literature but what hasn't gotten a lot of attention is that the dirty of the bang that i've seen from factors comes not from underweighting but from actually being short so the short side is where the majority of the bang is if you look at our funds um, you know the approach we use for long only portfolios and long short is identical. The factor tilts, when you look at the factor tilts, they look the same, but the long shorts have more alpha because the payoff to value, for example, or high quality is bigger on the short side. So buying, shorting low quality stocks will give you a higher return than being going long high quality stocks. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is the long side is where everyone's playing and that's kind of reason number one. The second is when you're shorting, there's a lot of active risk management that's required. And a lot of people don't want to deal with that or they do it wrong. So it's a little bit harder to capture operationally. But I, you know, my experience has been is that short component has presents much more of an opportunity for value added than the long component. Do you typically have exposure, long short exposure to all the different factors at any given time? Or, or are you emphasizing ones that you think are particularly, you know, for whatever it's momentum or valuation or whatever you're using or, or particularly attractive? Or, or are you typically having exposure to everything? We typically have exposure to everything. What we vary is the degree, right? So four years ago, value hadn't been working. So we didn't have a lot of value bias in our portfolios. We still had a little bit, but then, you know, Last year was a big value year. So if you look at our portfolios now, they have a significant valuation bias and they have a significant quality bias because quality has worked really well in the last year. Momentum as a factor hasn't worked that well, so it doesn't have a big weight. But I, I really want to kind of want to come back to your thought with the with longs and shorts because when you say have a value bias, the first thing that goes through people's minds is, oh, you're buying cheap stocks. And it's like, no, I'm actually shorting really, really expensive stocks. The weighted average PE of the short portfolio is over 200. The weighted average PE of the long portfolio is just slightly lower than the market. So all the, sh the value bias is coming from shorting these crazy expensive moonshot stocks. So, I, you know, it, it, it's really... Um, it's really worth kind of breaking it apart that way. And are you, in terms of your factor exposures, is, I mean, is factor momentum your primary driving factor in terms of which factors you're in and which one factors you're out or, or what your long short exposure is? Is the momentum of the factors the driving thing? Yes. Yeah. It's factor momentum. It's, yeah. If I had to pick a, a ratio, it's 80% factor momentum and 20% mean reversion because factors okay. do mean revert. So the ideal I mean, the ideal factor is something that has just started to work, but hasn't worked over the last three to five years, right? Then you really need to know, you know, it's got mean reversion and momentum working for it. A little bit like value was last year. I want to pick back up on the risk management thing, um, because I remember we had Jack Schwager on the podcast a while back, and he was talking about a, an interview he did with Joel Greenblatt. And, you know, Joel Greenblatt was talking about how buying cheap stocks and shorting expensive stocks is a great strategy. And Jack kind of said to him, well, why don't you put 100% of your portfolio in that? And, and Greenblatt said, well, because I would blow up. Um, because at certain times, you know, being long value cheap stocks and being short really expensive stocks is bad. So, and I know you're using many, many more factors than that. So how do you think about that risk management component? You know, making sure you don't have too much exposure to one factor. So building the portfolio using a risk model is pretty important because if you, if you build it with a single factor focus, it'll turn out to have a lot of risk. So you have to have some rules in place or use a risk model that basically says spread the risk across this. And I've written a bunch of papers on this that shows the benefit of having diversified uh, factor exposure. But that's true even in a long only portfolio. But in a long short, I think the hardest thing is that 
your mistakes aren't self-correcting, right? I mean, in, in a long-only portfolio, if you buy the longs, if you, if you go long a stock, you buy a stock, and it doesn't appreciate or it goes down, the position size shrinks. So you don't have to admit you made a mistake, right? Maybe you, you'll say, hey, it's going to come back. But in a short portfolio, when you're wrong, the size of the position is growing, <laughs> sometimes even faster than you can ever imagine. So you need to admit you're wrong and trim it back. And that, I think, is the single hardest thing about running a long short portfolio. And that's why quants do pretty well at it, because we have a disciplined set of rules we don't have to admit we made a mistake. We can kind of hide behind the, this is part of our process. You need to rebalance this, right? And that, I think, is is why shorting expensive stocks just by themselves with a large portion of your portfolio is really, really hard. To, is really, it's a bad idea. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's this um, wonderful thing you should, everybody needs to learn about at least a little bit you know, that calls, it's called Shannon's Demon. Are you familiar with it at all? It, yes. Yeah. But it's this idea that you can have something risky, but if you have it in the right proportion and you rebalance effectively, it can be accretive to your portfolio. But you can't have too much of it. And I think this idea is not sufficiently well understood by investors. And spending a little time and learning about it is really, really important. Yeah, you know, thinking about the risk on the short side, it made me, it reminded me of GameStop because, you know, I think a lot of people that were short GameStop, you know, your average investor who looked at their portfolio and if they had, you know, 2% of their portfolio short GameStop, they would say, oh, you know, that's not a huge risk. That's not a big problem. But it turned out a 2% short position in GameStop, if you didn't manage it, if you didn't reduce it, like ended up blowing funds up. Um, it was such an issue. So you can tell like the risk on the short side is definitely magnified. Right. But if you kept the position on, but you kept trimming it back to 2%, and you stayed in the game, you eventually made money off it, right? That's right. Yeah. I think I, I know the last time I was on the show, I talked about that um, that book by William Poundstone. It's called Fortune's Formula. So it talks about, you know, the Clary, Kelly criterion and sizing your positions consistently so you have enough money always remaining to stay in the game. And that is is so important when you're running a short portfolio. How do you think about managing uh, long short factor portfolios internationally? I know you, you run a global fund and a U.S. fund. Is there anything different you do between the two, or is it pretty much the same exact approach works in either place? So there are some differences. Um, the U.S. fund we have a lot more data on companies. You know, we know what the insiders are buying and selling the stock. Uh, we have access to, for example, we have access to 10Ks that we can use AI programs to read the 10Ks to figure out what's going on. That's hard to do currently outside the U.S. because a lot of the annual reports are in foreign languages, and so it's a little harder to actually read these mechanically. So there are some differences in terms of the alpha, but the overall risk management is is very similar. Something that um, has changed, I, I would say, in the decade or so I've been running these funds is that, you know, 10 years ago, country factors, so the importance of countries, was not that important. So countries really didn't matter that much. So, you know, you could be uh, Nestle in Switzerland or, you know, Mars, Cadbury in the UK. Nobody really cared about that. But what's happened is country factors over the last five years have become really, really important. So what it means is you need to manage your country diversification a lot more carefully than you did 10 years ago. So that's been a kind of an evolution for us that countries have increasingly started to be important. So you need to manage exposure around that. So the, so the correlation of like the individual securities within countries has been going up over time? Yes. Yeah. And it is really matters. I mean, especially during COVID, right? You saw the country responses. Every response was country specific. I mean, Germany was very different than France, even though, even though they're both part of the EU. And have you seen it? Does it has it gone up regionally as well? Like, you know, is, is Europe more correlated than it used to be? Or is, is that not true? It's really more at a country level. So Europe, I mean, so all the countries are, the country returns are less correlated. So you need to treat each individual country kind of separately, okay. right? And so I would say the correlations are, seem like they're slowly 
falling apart. And it's this trend that we refer to as sort of deglobalization. That for a while there, it seemed like, you know, you were having products that were made in, you know, designed in California, made in China and uh, assembled in Malaysia and then shipped here. And that seems like it's falling apart a little bit. How do you think about like long short equity as a return source in your portfolio? Like I know a lot of people that are listening probably won't have long short equity as something in their portfolio. I mean, is it sort of an absolute return type thing? Is, is another source of return you can couple with some other things together? I mean, is that a good general way to think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I mean, for me, it's the primary source of return in my portfolio. So I get two things from it. I get the alpha and I get the equity risk premium because it's 70% net long. So I get the equity risk premium, but then it's, $130 of notional exposure that has other factor premia embedded in it. And so I think of it not as an S&P alternative or MSCI alternative, but rather, look, this is a package of sources of return, and it should have a very high shop ratio. So I focus on the shop ratio of the strategy, not the information ratio, which is so tracking or focused. And you know, I mean, the reason we all want equities is not because we like equities, but because of the return profile, right? The positive mean in the long run, the volatility is not is not sufficiently high that it's going to kill you. Um, and so this is really a, an alternative to investing in equities. So, I mean, when I look at people who who buy the fund, we've had clients in there for over some of the clients. I think the longest client now is 12 years or something like that. They view it as, look, is this a, is this better than buying equities? Does it have a shop ratio? Does it have a decent return? And decent meaning an equity-like return. And that's how I view it. I want to ask you, you alluded earlier to international exposure. And, you know, we've, we've had a debate with a lot of guests on the podcast about this. You know, we've had some people who say we've got multinational companies in the U.S., you know, kind of the Jack Bogle view. You know, you get everything you need from U.S. From US stocks. And then we have other people who say, you know, no, when you look at the actual data, it says there are significant diversification benefits to inter investing internationally. So how do you think about that sort of international exposure with your portfolio? So this is probably the, my single biggest mistake in the last um, 40 years uh, in, with hindsight is having international stocks in my personal portfolio, right? Because the U.S. has been the best asset class by far. Um I mean, when I moved to the U.S. in the mid-'80s, I think the U.S. was like somewhere around 30% of the G7, 35% of G7, and now it's 65% of G7. Uh, you know, the U.S. has more patents filed every year than Germany and China combined. So it has been the dominant uh, growth engine of the world. So in hindsight, I would say I wish I'd had more, more of a U.S. allocation, uh, but that's always going to be the case, right? You're always going to look back and say, there's this one asset I could have bought that would have really made it for me. Uh, so I still think I'm an advocate for a globally diversified portfolio um, because I think there's a significant alpha opportunities even present outside the U.S. But I'm not sure what the right weighting is for the reasons you mentioned, in that U.S. companies are very diversified, especially the large ones. Uh, I mean, no one would have predicted the success that Apple's iPhone has had in China, right? But they've done an incredible job of of, of promoting that. Um, so I would say, you know, you do need a globally diversified portfolio. Uh, it's hard for me to make the case that you should just be in one country because the opportunities are going to vary by country. Uh, but I do, I'm, I'm less rabid about having a global portfolio than I was 35 years ago. And part of that is, you know, is some of the startups I've been involved with have been outside the U.S. And when you're involved with a business, you know, I obviously built a business, sold it to uh, Allspring, um, when you're involved with in running a business in the U.S., you get a sense of how pro-business the environment is. I mean, our labor laws are relatively flexible. It's, it's surprisingly easy to start a firm. Uh, very different if you try to do that in Europe or the U.K. Uh, 
I, you know, I, I didn't realize how, how hard it was till I was involved in businesses trying to do that. And I was sort of shaking my head going, wow, this is really, really hard. And I can see why entrepreneurs just don't want to deal with that. So long-winded answer to your question that, yes, I think, I think there are benefits from global diversification, but I would maintain a portfolio that's probably 65% U.S. as opposed to the, um, you know, cap-weighted number. So... I'm just curious, have you ever looked at like the idea of maybe using momentum to determine like the U.S. international exposure? Like if you would, you know, because one of the things we've all kind of, and I've run into the trap myself too, is international stocks have been cheap for such a long time, you know, that they, it, it, the returns just haven't been there, but the valuations have been really, really good. And so I, I wonder if there's any kind of strategy around that about like using momentum maybe to, to do the rotation. It, it does work, but there's not much breadth to it, right? Because they're talking about 20 different countries. So... You know, and usually it's going to be dominated by do you get Japan right and do you get the UK right and Germany right? So it's really three countries in there, which is what, why it's really hard to do. One thing I wanted to ask you was uh, to go back to the overall asset allocation. So you have 35% in the non marketable private investments and then 65 in the other exposures that we talked about, you know, your funds, um, the EM debt. And, and the stuff that, you know, we, we, we just walk, work through. But I'm wondering, is the 65%, would you consider that less risky than, let's just say, something like the S&P 500? Because what I'm trying to really uncover here is the 35% in non-marketable securities is that's kind of risky stuff. I mean, it's not liquid and, you know, you don't know what the outcome's really going to be. They're either going to be successful, hopefully, or, you know, some of them might not be. So there's a chance that, you know, some of them could maybe go to zero. And so is the 65% sort of more the risk managed because of that um, private company st stock exposure? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's because of the private company. It's because I don't see the benefit of having high-risk equities. So the 65% portfolio, it's got 70% equity exposure. So you think the beta would be 0.7. The beta is actually close to 0.3. Right. So I'm buying very low risk equity or highly hedged market neutral type equity products in that portfolio. Yeah, so th that's just the way you want that you know, sleeve, which is the majority of your assets. That's the way you want that to be managed. So it's not like... It's because you have 35% on the other side. That's just your belief in terms of getting your risk premium, basically. Right. And also, you know, I mean, 70% market exposure. So I got, a, I got more equities than most, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. in, including, not counting the uh, private component. But the other part of it is, you know, if you think about somebody in my business, uh, especially when I own my own firm, but even now, our revenues go up and down with the market because the fees are driven by uh, the AUM. So anytime you can hedge that by having a low beta, you're better off. Uh, so I'm very aware of that, that maybe for somebody um, who is not in this business, it's, they won't worry about it so much. But for me, when the, mar when the market drops 20%, Generally, revenues drop by 20%. That means your income for that year is going to be hurt by way more than that because you got to make sure everybody gets paid before you get the residual. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the common, definitely one of the common themes with many of the people we've had on this show your portfolio because our income is tied to the markets. And so looking for those different sources of returns where things aren't going to blow up on you when you go into a bear market. I mean, that's, you know, how a lot of these guys have, sort of uh, constructed their portfolios and yours is uh, somewhat similar. Um, I wanted to go in, on, the, on the, uh, the private startup side, you had mentioned the Blueberry Farm and some of these other interesting businesses. So I don't know, can you just flush out a little bit more how you go about looking at private deals? I mean, you mentioned some of these are your friends. So of course you trust these people, you like the business plan, but what other things do you look at um, on the private side? Yeah, so the, the friendship part gets over the first hurdle, right? Which is, is it a scam or not? Obviously, if they're a friend of yours, it's probably not a scam, or at least reduces the chance that it's a scam. 
the second part of it is what's the idea uh, and usually it's technology based so with the blueberry farm idea the person had a a really key concept around building um, something centered around organic blueberries and using a lot of technology for the harvesting so i thought it was an it was a clearly demonstrable edge versus the way everybody else was doing it um, another startup i was involved in was um, around pension plans in the uk and pension plans in the uk became mandatory about 10 years ago it was the auto enrollment thing and everybody came up with proprietary product and this guy I know had an idea for building an open architecture platform, much like we have here with Schwab and Fidelity. Hmm. And I could see that, I, I can see that that's where the business ought to go, as opposed to just having one fund you can buy in your pension. So I said, that's where the business is gonna go, so I'm gonna invest in that, in that business. And then the, you know, and then some of the ideas around <clears throat> someone looking at a company that's, you know, owned by a, you know, and somebody who's a, a leader in the business, but they haven't really grown it. So they're looking to buy it and then institutionalize it. So something like that I would invest in as well. But it's always, I don't actually seek out the opportunities. Usually some you you're talking to someone and say, look, I'm thinking of doing this. And I go, that's a neat idea. You know, how do I participate in it? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I wanted to pivot and ask you about uh, inflation just for a second here because, um, you know, we've, we're sort of in an environment where, and we've been for the last year and a half or so, where inflation's been a lot higher. Is there anything that, uh, any changes that you've made to your portfolio because of the potential for higher inflation now and in the future? Not really, Justin. Um, and part of that, I mean, part of that, I think, stems from... Um, kind of a bias in that I grew up in an era with really high inflation, right? I mean, I grew up in in the 70s, so double-digit inflation was pretty common. So whenever, I, whenever I've been investing, I'm always thinking about the fact that if I don't buy an asset where the earnings are actually growing, I'm going to fall behind, right? The only way you can hedge inflation is to buy an asset you know, whether it's equity or real estate, or but something where the earnings are actually growing, and that allows you to participate in it. And that has always been almost sort of, I've taken that risk off the table by, by doing that. So that's, I think, one of the reasons very early on I didn't invest in fixed income because I kind of went, well, what happens if inflation takes off? I mean, I'm from Sri Lanka. Last year, the inflation rate there was 60%, um, and the treasury yields were at 20. So you can't, I mean, you can't keep up with fixed income. You didn't mention this, but I'm just going to ask it anyways. And um, have you dabbled at all or had you ever considered anything in like crypto Bitcoin or is that just not on the radar and not something you're interested in? Yeah, I am actually involved with something that that is in the crypto in crypto space. But I what I like about crypto is really the underlying technology. Uh, I think it's a great way to keep track of ownership. It's actually the modern way to keep track of ownership. It's a great way to collateralize any asset and be able to split ownership of it. Um, so, you know, think about a world in which I want to sell part, part of my house or the claim on my house, and I can collateralize that and split that a bunch of different ways using a blockchain ledger and sell that off. I love that idea. Uh, to me, the issue with crypto is the, the the whole idea that there's a coin is troubling to me because there's nothing backing it. So I would say I love the technology in crypto. I haven't been an investor in the coins themselves because I can't see what the underlying income generating mechanism is that's going to result in them growing in value. I mean, it's a little bit like saying, you know, something is going to grow in value because there's a scarcity of it. And that's been true, right? I mean, if you look at Rembrandts, the, as a number of rich guys in the world have gone up, the price of Rembrandts has gone up, right? I'm a car guy. If you look at the price, you know, when I first started looking at cars, you could buy a Ferrari GTO for 
two or three million, right? Now it's 60 million because there's only so many of them and the number of rich guys has gone through mm -hmm. the roof. So, I mean, scarcity does matter, but I have a hard time applying scarcity to, you know, cryptocurrency. You had mentioned before that you know, one of the mistakes um, was maybe being a little bit too global with your portfolio, but can you think of anything else in your sort of investing experience that, you know, you sort of, um, that was a mistake and you, you sort of learned from? Yeah, uh, you know, so not having enough uh, leverage in the portfolio when I first started was a mistake. Uh, I think leverage is, I increasingly use leverage in my portfolio as I became older. Um, and when I first started, I definitely was too conservative. And part of that was you don't, you don't have that much money and you're really worried about losing it. Um, so if you looked at my asset allocation over time, what you'll see is over time, it's got more notional exposure. So notional exposure has grown but the beta has come down. So I wish I, if I knew now, if I knew then what I knew now, I would definitely have had more notional exposure when I started investing in my late twenties. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because like, you'll, you'll typically hear when people talk about their mistakes, they'll obviously talk about too much leverage. Um, and you know, one of the things we've learned you know, through this podcast is, you know, leverage is not always, I mean, leverage obviously is something that can be very, very dangerous if used improperly, but leverage doesn't always add to risk. And, you know, whenever we mention leverage in a podcast, we'll get some comments on YouTube, like, you know, that this guy is suggesting leverage, this is going to blow people up. But, you know, the reality is, you know, if, if you're using leverage to introduce uncorrelated things into your portfolio, you can do it prudently without adding risk to your portfolio. And I, and I think that's a lesson, you know, we've learned in a lot of these episodes. And I think it's a, it's a lesson a lot of investors can learn, you know, as long as you know the right way to do it. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to do, right, Jack? I mean, it's like if you, so if you're most of your assets are in a, IRA or 401k, it's hard to do without be, without buying some kind of leverage ETF. And those often are a bad idea because of the way they're structured. So unless you have a margin account or something like that, it's 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 difficult. It's difficult to do. I'll never forget I when I first uh, uh, I joined Analytic in the in the mid 80s, and I was talking to the person who was. Um, the CIO at the time, and we were talking about asset allocation, and you know, he said, "Oh, you know, what's your allocation?" And I gave him the allocation, and he kind of looked at me and said, "You don't have any leverage in your portfolio?" And he was sort of amazed because he was, you know, thirty years older than I am. And he kind of goes, "No, no, 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 you got to do this." And I, I remember looking at him, going, "That sounds really risky," but you know, he'd been doing it for a while, and he said, "No, you need to get a margin loan, and here's what you need to do to leverage that portfolio." So, but unless somebody had walked me through it, I wouldn't have actually realized, okay, this is what I need to do to leverage it. We have a, uh, we have a question we always ask as we wrap up towards the end here. And I was excited to ask you because the question relates to the fact that I have a sale vote. And so we, we would like to ask about things that you get a lot of benefit from personally that maybe are not the greatest financial decision. And, you know, whenever we've asked this question, we've typically gotten a lot of answers of, you know, well, there's not really anything I do like that. So I give the example of my boat, you know, which is, I believe we talked about, you know, you, you're in the boating a little bit too. And, you know, boats can be a terrible investment from a financial perspective, but they can be an awesome investment in terms of time with your family and friends and things like that. And so I was excited to ask you about this because I know you do some things from our first episode that might actually fit well into this bucket. So can you talk a little bit about maybe some, something you do that might not be the greatest financial investment, but might be something you get a lot of benefit from in your life? Yeah, I'm not sure I would use the word sailboat and investment in the same sentence. <laughs> yeah, I probably shouldn't either. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I mean, I love having great experiences, and you know, the two things I I really enjoy doing that make no financial sense, but and they're incredibly expensive. One is is sailing. I love doing sailboat racing. Uh, my wife loves sailing, and some of the memories we have. I mean, you know, this year for Valentine's Day, she and I did a dual-handed race that lasted all day because there was no wind. But it was the best Valentine's Day ever uh, because. Every boat was, you know, double-handed. And it was a great way to spend the day and work as a team. And that memory, you know, will live with me for forever. And uh, so I'm a big believer in, you know, if you're fortunate enough to be able to do things like that, uh, you don't pay tax on that kind of enjoyment. 
Um, so it's a it's a really good way uh, to spend your to spend your money, uh, and I think it's a the income there is the psychic income is really great. You know, I love messing with old race cars, and to me, some of the memories I've been able to create doing racing events with my kids, with my boys, has been wonderful. So you know, coming to a track together, spending all weekend racing together. Those are wonderful memories, and uh, so those are two ways I, you know, burn money, so to speak. And I don't think of it as uh, an investment. I think of it as, you know, creating something that, when I get old and I'm unable to do any of those things, I'm going to look back and, you know, have some really good memories. Yeah, and you know, you've uh, you won up me a little bit on the sailing side because you know I've become pretty much a guy who races my boat on Wednesday nights. You know, do the beer can races around the buoys, and you actually are you're doing distance racing and you, you do some intense stuff that's uh far beyond what i'm doing yeah i'm actually you know I'm, i turned 65 in two years um so i'm planning on uh racing from san francisco to hawaii single-handed so that's it's been quite a project getting ready for that so um, i'll let you know how it goes with the preparation yeah, yeah definitely keep us updated if there's any way we can do the podcast while you're out there i know that's a long shot but that would be definitely <laughs> unique <laughs> Actually, Justin, you know, it, it is surprising with with Starlink, um, you know, the mm -hmm. Elon Musk uh, communication product, how good the communication is on a sailboat, in, even in the open ocean, um, and how inexpensive it is. I mean, it's a $200 a month service that allows you to communicate live with, you know, almost a one megabit connection, sorry, you know, a several hundred megabit connection out in the open ocean. It's, in, it's, it's insane. So we like to ask all of our guests a final standard closing question, and that is um, if you could impart one lesson that you've learned from building your personal portfolio to the average investor, what would that be? That would be the importance of rebalancing. Uh, you know, whenever there is volatility, it's really important to rebalance your portfolio. And I think it's not only doing it, but understanding why you're doing it. So, you know, understanding what's referred to in the industry by some as Shannon's demon is really, really important. And that can be a really critical driver of returns that's much overlooked in this industry. Thank you very much, Ren. This has been great. Uh, it's the second time on. Hopefully we can have you on a third time. Uh, maybe it'll be after the race and we can hear, hear how it went. So good luck. Thanks for having me on, Jack and Justin. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant, and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube, or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.